Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin and on this channel I upload all sorts of content relating to true crime, education and psychology related topics. So if that sounds like something you'd enjoy and you haven't already subscribed then please do so as well as turning on the little notification button so you know whenever I upload a new video. For today's video we're discussing a UK serial killer case which I haven't done in a long time and it is going to be a long video so if you haven't already get yourself a cup of tea, get comfy because we're going to be talking through a lot of details today. The case we're going to be discussing today is that of the Stockwell Strangler but before we get started discussing the case I'm just going to zoom through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research of certain sources on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong leave things out or mispronounce things I apologise if I do any of these things, I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I'm simply working with the information that I have available to me. So with all that being said, we shall just jump straight in and start discussing the case of the Stockwell Strangler. The case of the Stockwell Strangler takes place in Stockwell in South London in the year of 1986. At this time, Stockwell was considered one of the more deprived areas of London, although from what I can gather this isn't as much the case anymore. And the case of the Stockwell Strangler's murders remain some of the most infamous incidents to have occurred in this area. The first victim had been 78 year old Nancy Eileen Ems, a retired school teacher who lived alone in a small basement flat in West Hill Road in Wandsworth. She was known to be a recluse and the conditions she was living in had been considered to be verging on slum-like. It was known that she was suffering from mild dementia and this was likely the reason for the conditions that she had been living in. She had allegedly organised some help through the council for someone to come and visit her home once a week or so to help clean up the home and to cook some meals for her. And on the morning of the 9th of April 1986, the worker had headed round to Nancy's flat for their weekly visit. When they'd had no response after knocking on the front door, they decided to let themselves in and this is when they discovered the remains of Nancy M's lying in bed. On a first glance, it had appeared as though nothing unusual or concerning had happened as it seemed like Nancy had passed away in her sleep in her bed with the covers tucked up under her chin. Sadly, it wasn't an uncommon occurrence amongst the elderly who didn't have a lot of friends or family that would regularly visit them for them to pass away in their sleep to only be discovered a few days later. And it seemed initially that this had been exactly what had happened to 78 year old Nancy Ems. When authorities had been notified and arrived on the scene, they had in their company a doctor to carry out like an on-scene initial examination. The doctor had signed a death certificate stating that Nancy Ems had died of natural causes and the authorities had even gone as far to start discussing what the next steps were in terms of potentially cremating the remains when something had caught their attention. The council worker who had initially discovered the remains and had visited Nancy's home on multiple occasions previously had suddenly noticed that amongst the clutter in inside her flat, her portable TV set was missing from its usual place. And when they told the authorities of this, they suddenly realised that the death of the elderly woman may not have been as open and shut as they had initially believed. An autopsy was soon carried out on the remains in order to establish whether these concerns were justified and it was soon realised that Nancy had likely met with foul play. The medical examiner had discovered that she had severe bruising all over her body as well as a number of cracked ribs and finger marks around her throat and there had also been obvious signs of sexual assault. Pathologists had stated that they believed that she had likely been attacked by an assailant while she was asleep with the killer having knelt on her chest and ultimately cracking her ribs. The assailant had then likely used his left hand to cover her mouth while grabbing her throat with the other and this had then been her cause of death. They had also been under the impression that the attacker had sexually assaulted her after she had died, which is when he then posed her and tucked her up in bed for someone to discover the remains. And it was clear to the authorities that they were dealing with a homicide, although they had initially believed it had been with a motive of burglary. Authorities had found no sign of forced entry into the property, but they did note that a window in the bedroom was left ajar. According to the help sent to Nancy's home by the council, she was known to sleep with the window open if it was warm, which it had been at the time of her death. The question remained, however, that if the intent had been to burgle the property, why would the assailant then proceed to kill and sexually assault her as well? As I said, Nancy Ems was a 78-year-old woman suffering from mild dementia and she struggled to take care of herself and her home, so if she had interrupted a burglar inside her home, she likely wouldn't have had the strength to fight them off. And they soon realised that whoever had carried out such an awful attack had likely done so of their own accord and with the intention of assaulting and killing her. 
something that is rather concerning to consider is that the attacker would have likely gotten away with this crime if he had not taken her TV with him as this had been the only thing that had raised suspicions. As a result of what the investigators had learned, a team of forensic scientists had been called to examine the scene of the murder thoroughly. And this is where they discovered a short hair in Nancy's bedsheets, one that tests were later determined to have come from a male of Afro-Caribbean background. Authorities also had on file a sample of semen found on the victim's body during the post-mortem that was carried out. Now with this information in investigation, nowadays it would have likely been that the investigators could move pretty quickly when it comes to searching for the identity of the attacker. However, DNA profiling had been in its very, very early stages at the time of this attack and so the authorities had to rely on lists of known burglars and sex offenders in the area at the time of the murder. They had been continuously working their way through this list of potential suspects when two months after the death of Nancy Ems, another elderly woman was found dead just five miles away from Nancy's flat. On the 9th of June 1986, the remains of 67-year-old Janet Cockett was found in her first floor flat in the Overton Road estate in Stockwell. And Janet's personal life and background had been rather different to that of Nancy M's. Janet had been a widow, but she had been married multiple times previously with four children from these marriages. She was known to be a rather sociable woman who regularly saw her family and took part in a number of local groups and organizations. And just as it had been the case with Nancy's murder, Janet was found lying in bed and she had appeared to look as though she had passed away peacefully in her sleep. But upon a closer inspection, authorities had discovered that she had actually been tucked into bed with no clothes on. Her nightdress had been ripped from her body and it had been folded up neatly in a chair next to the bed. When the remains were examined, it was determined that she had also been strangled by the attacker's bare hands, but unlike Nancy, there was no sign of sexual assault. And in terms of the scene of the crime, authorities noticed that Janet had kept a number of family photos on a mantelpiece inside the bedroom of the flat. But what had caught their attention about these photographs had been that each of them had either been turned away to face the wall or had been placed face down. The forensic team's thorough search of the scene had turned up a number of things that led them to believe that the attacker was not being entirely careful in terms of hiding his identity. They discovered a clear handprint on the window in the bathroom as well as a partial handprint on a pot that was found on the mantelpiece. Piece. And so authorities had returned to the list of known offenders in the area and were able to use these handprints collected from the scene to compare with those on file. From what I could gather, each of these murders had been handled by two different police stations because of the areas in which they occurred, but the details of each crime scene had been shared with the investigating teams of both stations. And they had ultimately decided that there had been nothing solid to suggest that these crimes had been carried out by the same person. In retrospect, this does seem rather unusual that these weren't considered to be similar enough to be potentially linked, but people had differing opinions at the time. And then two weeks after the murder of Janet Cockett, another victim was attacked. This time though, they had survived. 73-year-old Fred Prentice had been living in a retirement home called Bradmead in Clapham when on the 27th of June in 1986 he was awoken at around 3 in the morning. He had woken up and noticed that he had heard footsteps coming from the hallway outside of his room inside his home. He sat up and noticed a shadow move on the other side of the frosted glass door and then the door had opened to show what Fred described as a young man dressed in all dark clothing stood in the doorway. Fred had attempted to frantically turn on the light next to his bed, but as he did so, the assailant had looked at him and held his finger up to his own mouth as though to signal him to be quiet before then running and jumping on top of the victim. Fred hadn't had the chance to shout for help before the attacker had grabbed his throat and began squeezing. But not long after squeezing hard on his throat, the attacker looked at him and weakened his grip as though he was playing with him. He continued to repeat this four times with Fred stating that he had a chilling grin on his face the entire time. He told the authorities that during the whole ordeal, the attacker kept repeating the word kill over and over again. And because the attacker hadn't loosened his grip on Fred's throat, he hadn't been able to shout for help, but he did manage to struggle and lash his arms about enough to reach the panic button that was located on the wall just above his bed. The attacker reacted by throwing Fred against the wall and he'd run out of the room in mere seconds with the attending warden in the retirement home, arriving at Fred's flat just after a minute. The unknown attacker had fled the scene through the main door, but it was believed that he had entered through a window left open by Fred in an attempt to beat the heat. 
And because of the location and the time in which these three attacks on elderly victims had occurred, authorities had really started to consider the possibility of them being linked. But there remained one factor that continued to puzzle them. If they were all carried out by the same person, then how could they explain the unusual change in victim type? In the vast majority of cases, serial attackers and killers will have a set victim type and very rarely deviate from it, but in this case, if it had been carried out by the same person, they were not only attacking both elderly men and women, but the attacks weren't always of a sexual nature. But because of the fact that Fred Prentice had survived the attack, authorities were able to gain a description of the attacker to continue investigating. He had described the assailant as being young, likely no later than his mid-twenties, with dark hair and suntanned skin. And this had too been in the early days of offender profiling, but the authorities had theorised that because of the ease in which the attacker had entered and left each of the crime scenes, it was entirely possible that he had been a rather experienced burglar who'd only recently started to attack the homeowners as well. And from the description of the way that the unknown attacker had carried out the attack, they were sure they were dealing with someone who enjoyed the act of killing. The following night, all doubts of these acts being committed by the same person were destroyed when two more attacks had occurred in the same night. On the 28th of June in 1986, in the early hours of the morning, two elderly men were found dead in their neighbouring rooms in the Somerville Hastings house in Stockwell Park, Crescent. These victims were 84-year-old British Army veteran Valentine Glime and a 94-year-old Polish-born man who I'll have his name on the screen because I really cannot pronounce it, I'm so sorry. Both of the men had been strangled in their beds by their killer's bare hands and Valentine Glime had also been sexually assaulted. It was known that at around 4am, one of the members of staff who'd been working the night shift in the home had heard unusual noises coming from somewhere in the home that sounded as though someone had been using an electric razor. And because this was unusual, they had taken a quick peek down one of the corridors, which is where someone had allegedly seen a shadow and a very quick glimpse of a person walking through one of the corridors. And when they'd realised just how unusual this was for a retirement home, the staff members had armed themselves with whatever they could find and stood ground until the police had responded to their phone call. By the time the police had made it to the home, the assailant had long fled the scene, but it was quickly determined that he had managed to enter the home through an open window, just as he did in previous attacks. One extremely troubling thing that the authorities had noticed when examining the scene of the crimes had been that the attacker had managed to wash himself and have a full shave before murdering the two men. They had discovered a recently used flannel in the bathroom attached to one of the men's rooms, as well as an electric razor that had still been plugged in, and this is clearly what the staff member had appeared to have heard in the early hours of the morning. From what the staff had seen of the attacker, which had been very little, they had described a man that appeared to match the description previously provided by the surviving victim, Fred Prentice. And it was at this point that the authorities could no longer deny the fact that they were dealing with a serial killer attacking a very specific type of victim. In response, a large group of police officers dressed in civilian clothing were deployed to patrol local old people's homes in South London over the evenings and nights, and it appeared as though the attacker had become aware of this heavy police presence in anticipation for his next attack. Over a week after the murders of the two men in the Somerville Hastings home, the same assailant had carried out another murder, but this time it had been outside of Stockwell. 82-year-old William Carmen had lived in a flat at the Sybil Thorndike house on the Marques estate in Islington, across the River Thames from the previous attacks. In the early hours of the morning, somewhere between the 6th and the 9th of July, the unknown attacker had entered into William Carmen's flat through an open window and attacked the 82-year-old. He was found deceased, lying in his bed, and the authorities noted that he had also been posed by the assailant after his death. He had been strangled, just as the previous victims had been, as well as being sexually assaulted. They had also found signs to suggest that the attacker had also burgled the flat as well, as a number of his personal belongings had been taken, as well as around £500 in savings that he was believed to have had in cash inside of his home. They had been particularly confident that despite the fact that a few items across the attacks had been burgled, the main motive had appeared to have been murder. Three days after the murder of William Carmen, another elderly man was found dead. This time, the attack had occurred back in Clapham, inside a retirement home in Barton Court on Jeffreys Road. 75-year-old Trevor Thomas was found dead inside his bath in his home, and it was determined that he had likely been deceased for multiple weeks prior to discovery. 
and because of the condition in which he was found, the vast majority of the forensic evidence had decayed, so they couldn't determine for certain that his cause of death had been strangulation and whether or not he had been sexually assaulted. Because of this, Trevor Thomas was not originally considered a victim of the Stockwell Strangler, but it is worth noting that authorities at the time had been heavily certain that he had been another victim of the same man. And then, just eight days after this, on the 20th of July, 74-year-old William Downs was discovered murdered in the very same retirement home in which the Stockwell Strangler had killed his second victim, Janet Cockett. William Downs had lived alone and was reported to very rarely leave the flat that he lived in, so much so that he was considered by the staff to be essentially a recluse. On the morning of the 20th of July, William's son had arrived to visit his father and discovered his remains in bed. And authorities were able to determine that he had been strangled and sexually assaulted, once again discovering that the assailant had entered through an open window. They had also discovered a handprint on the garden gate to the home as well as on the kitchen wall. It was at this point that the unidentified serial killer had been given the nickname the Stockwell Strangler and the media coverage surrounding the investigation was constant and extensive. Authorities had informed the public that they were continuing their hunt for the unknown attacker and they believed that they could predict some of his future movements of this man based on the information that they were able to gain from the previous incidents. They knew that he had entered through open windows and targeted low-rise buildings making it easy for him to gain access from the outside. He was targeting buildings that clearly housed mainly elderly residents as all of the properties would have things like railings and signs outside. Because of the description provided by Fred Prentice, they believed that they were on the hunt for a young white male with short dark hair, possibly suntanned, who had a very distinctive smile. Since all but two of the attacks had taken place in the Stockwell area, they theorised that he was either likely from Stockwell or likely from somewhere close enough for him to be familiar with it. He may possibly have previously or currently have employment where he would have regular contact with retirement homes and this access would then give him the opportunity to plan for his next attacks. And the authorities had a strong suspicion that he was a well-versed burglar despite the fact that he did appear lazy in terms of leaving behind forensic evidence. It went without saying that this attacker had some form of sexual disturbance as well as likely being particularly mentally unstable because of the nature of the attacks. And the authorities knew that they needed to act quickly because he would likely continue to carry out these sudden and brutal attacks without warning. There was so much fear amongst the elderly in South London at the time because of the extensive news coverage of the attacks and everyone had become so aware that the killer had been seemingly attacking at random times. But the most positive thing to have come out of this extensive news coverage had been that the knowledge of these attacks had led the elderly population to be so aware of the dangers of leaving open their windows and families were becoming much more vigilant in an attempt to protect themselves. A telephone line was set up by a local charity for elderly people to ring up and gain support if they were feeling worried or fearful of these attacks. And the authorities had also increased the amount of patrols in the area, especially overnight in addition to these officers in civilian clothing being stationed around retirement homes. And at the same time, they continued to sift through their records in an attempt to find a match for the handprints collected at the previous murder scenes. They were able to confirm that the handprints collected at the scene of William Downs's murder had matched the print collected at the scene of Janet Cockett's murder that had occurred in the same retirement estate. But because of the time in which these attacks had taken place, the digital storage of fingerprints and handprints were in its very early stages and so not everything was readily available for them to sift through. A team of law enforcement officers had been set up to manually compare the palm prints of the Stockwell Strangler to the previous files that were not yet stored digitally, mainly focusing their search on criminals who had been found to operate in the South London area. But before they could find a match, the killer had struck again. On the 24th of July 1986, 80-year-old Florence Tisdall was found dead in her ground floor apartment in the Rainley Gardens in Hurlingham. Florence was both partially deaf and blind and she required a walking frame to be able to move about and because of this she didn't often get out of her apartment. She had three cats inside of her apartment that she was known to adore as well as having a habit of feeding the stray cats in the area. And because of this she was known to leave open one of her windows in order for the cats to enter and leave the apartment whenever they wanted. The day before the discovery of her remains she was known to have made a special trip to a local hairdresser to have her hair done for her planned celebrations of the Duke and Duchess of York's wedding. She was a huge supporter of the royal family and made plans to watch the broadcast of the wedding on the television that day while enjoying a drink. And that evening she had headed to bed early while leaving the window open as she usually did for the cats. But the unidentified attacker had taken advantage of this and he had attacked the 80 year old in an unusually early hour of the evening in comparison to his previous attacks. 
Lawrence's body wasn't found until the following morning when a caretaker in the building had called in just to check on her, only to find her tucked up in bed. Authorities had determined that she too had been strangled and sexually assaulted, as well as having two broken ribs where her attacker had knelt on her chest. The autopsy had placed her death at being less than 12 hours before her discovery, confirming the belief that the killer had attacked in the early evening as opposed to the early hours of the morning, like in previous attacks. And what was so chilling about this discovery had been that the attack would have likely occurred when more people would have been around and awake, but even if she had managed to put up a fight, it seemed unlikely that she would have been heard because of the celebration occurring. A pub located opposite her home had been particularly busy and noisy as they were hosting a celebration following the royal wedding and sadly no one had been alerted during the attack. When the news of this attack had spread, the authorities had come under much scrutiny for not having made any developments in their investigation, but then the search through records of palm prints suddenly provided a breakthrough. The palm prints were found to match that on file of a Kenneth Erskine, a 24-year-old drifter and known burglar. He was known to have lived in multiple squats around the Brixton and Stockwell areas, and because the palm prints could directly link him to two of the murder scenes, police had set out immediately to stake out the squat in which he was last known to be staying in. But but when they'd arrived at this location in Brixton, they discovered that he'd not been there for quite some months and it was not known where he had moved on to. Authorities were soon able to establish a location in which he was known to frequently visit. It was a social security department office in South London where he would pick up his weekly unemployment benefit payment. He had visited the same place every week for the previous two years and as a result, authorities would learn that he was rather well known by the employees. According to them, he was always very quiet whenever he did speak and because of this, the staff had given him the nickname The Whisperer. Since the authorities had been confident he would soon turn up at the office, a team of officers were stationed outside the building in anticipation for his arrival. And then on the 28th of July 1986, when Kenneth Erskine had arrived at the office to collect his money, he was arrested and taken to Clapham Police Station. So a little bit of background information into Kenneth Erskine before moving ahead with the investigation of the Stockwell Strangler attacks. Kenneth Erskine was born on the 1st of July 1962 in Hammersmith. He was the eldest of four children and his mother was English while his father was from Antigua. The family had all lived together in Putney while Kenneth was growing up and it was not a particularly stable upbringing for Kenneth and his brothers. Four brothers would spend a lot of time throughout their childhood in various care homes or with foster parents as a result of their troubled home life. It was known that those who knew Kenneth from his neighbourhood in which he had grown up in, they had remembered him as being an upbeat young child who was always reading his Bible and wanting peace in the world. But when his parents divorced in the 1970s, it was believed that his behaviour had changed drastically. He was known to start bullying younger children with reported incidents of him attacking them suddenly with no provoking and even in some cases tying them up. As a result of his sudden behavioural issues, he was soon informed that he would have to enrol in a school targeted for maladjusted children. During his times at a number of these schools, he would continue acting out in aggressive attacks both on staff and other students. There was one incident in particular where he pushed another student off of a moving bus. He also started a fire in one of the schools as well as holding a nurse hostage by holding a pair of scissors to her throat. He'd also been caught on multiple occasions trying to hold students' head under water during swimming lessons and before long the staff had realised that they would need to drastically change their approach to disciplining him. Whenever the staff would attempt to respond to him in a friendly and calm way instead of immediately disciplining him, he would respond by acting out in some extremely disturbing way in an attempt to shock them or throw them. In one incident he responded by exposing himself and touching himself in front of them and in another he had responded by rubbing himself up against as though to be sexually suggestive. And so it appeared that from a young age, he was not only showing signs of homicidal tendencies, but also being sexually disturbed. By the time he was 16, Kenneth was kicked out by his family after them having had enough of his behavioural problems and his aggressive outbursts. Around the same time, there were records of him attempting to hang one of his younger brothers on multiple occasions, as well as attempting to give him cannabis. And after being disowned completely by his family, he became a drifter, mainly living in squats around Britain. Brixton and Stockwell. During his time as a drifter, he started drinking heavily and using hard drugs and he burgled homes as a means of income. Aside from burglaries, he was known to have carried out other petty crimes like vandalism in different areas. In the known acts of burglary, he was known to have never stolen a lot that was worth much, 
only on few occasions he would leave the property with electricals or jewellery that he could then sell on for a slightly higher price. And since burglary was his means of funding his drug habit, he soon became a particularly experienced burglar. He had, however, fallen on the radar of the police on numerous occasions, as it appeared that despite his experience in burglary, he had been particularly reckless. He was arrested numerous times on burglary charges and ended up serving time in the Feltham Young Offenders Institution in Hounslow. And while in prison, he was known to spend his time painting and drawing particularly disturbing images, which he would then hang on his cell wall. Every image he drew appeared to depict elderly people suffering or dying in disturbing ways, oftentimes with them being in bed, sometimes having been stabbed, others gagged or even decapitated. The doctors working in the institution had recommended that he not be released until he received further psychological help, but he was released in 1982 anyway. And following his release, he fell straight back into his old transient lifestyle, carrying out petty crimes to fund his drug habits. Following Erskine's arrest in 1986, authorities were not able to track down anyone who had been a close friend of his or anything, or even anything that he had in his possession aside from the, the clothes that he was wearing. They found that once the interrogation relating to the Stockwell Strangler's attacks had begun, it was extremely difficult to question him. Numerous psychologists had interviewed Erskine over the years and they placed his mental age at being that of a preteen. He behaved rather strangely and appeared to always be in a world of his own. He would daydream and stare into the air and giggle at nothing. It was theorised that he lacked the ability to determine what was reality and what was in his head. It was actually learned that over the years he had opened a total of 10 different accounts through both the bank and the building society where he would hold any money that he made from burglaries and as a result he had around £3,000 across them. Erskine never confessed to having committed any of the murders and the authorities only had physical evidence to connect him to two of the killings. They had to continue working to establish whether there was any more evidence that could connect him to the other killings as well as to the attempted murder on Fred Prentice. As a result, to seek out any potential witnesses, the police had released two images of Erskine, two media outlets that were available at the time, and the authorities had received countless calls in response. They soon realised that the majority of these calls had been placed from individuals who worked regularly in the Brixton area, where he was obviously known to spend a lot of time living in squats, and they recognised him just from being out and about. But one sighting in particular had appeared to be particularly important to the case. A 25-year-old woman named Denise Keener had informed the police that she had had an encounter with a man on Putney Bridge at around 11.30pm on the night of the final murder. She claimed that she had encountered this man who made her feel very terrified and disturbed and that he appeared very, very disturbed himself, as well as stating that he proceeded to vomit in front of her. She'd been so scared by the stranger that she decided to call for the police, but by the time they'd arrived, the man had fled. The main thing that she had described about the stranger had been his chilling grin that he'd had on his face the entire time, a description that appeared all too similar to that described by Fred Prentice. When she had seen the images of the suspect in the Stockwell Strangler attacks, she had recognised him instantly as being the man that she'd had this strange encounter with, and this had been just a few streets away from the flat where Florence Tisdall had been murdered less than an hour before. Police had put together a lineup, including Kenneth Erskine, and called in Denise and Fred Prentice to determine whether they could identify any of the men in the lineup as being the man that they had encountered. The pair had both been certain when identifying Kenneth Erskine as being the man that they were looking for. As a result, Kenneth Erskine was charged with the attempted murder of Fred Prentice, as well as the murders of Janet Cockett and William Downs. And while being held in custody awaiting trial, he ended up being charged with all of the other murders believed to have been carried out by the Stockwell Strangler, aside from that of Trevor Thomas. The trial of Kenneth Erskine had began on 12th of January in 1988 at the Old Bailey Court in London, where he faced the seven murders murder charges and one attempted murder. He pleaded not guilty to all of the charges and it was noted that he appeared out of it during the entire trial as, as though he didn't really know what was going on. At some point in the trial it appeared as though he had fallen asleep and had to be nudged awake as well as allegedly appearing to be masturbating during the trial which had created quite a scene in the courtroom. There were a number of witnesses who testified during the trial including Denise Keener, Fred Prentice and also a member of staff who had spotted the assailant on shift inside the Somerville Hastings 
Erskine's house. The tapes of Erskine's interviews carried out by the police upon his arrest were played during the trial, in which he can be heard confessing to burgling the homes of each of the victims, before then saying that someone else must have followed him to the locations and entered the home after he'd left to carry out the murders. Despite this claim, on January the 26th of 1988, Kenneth Erskine was found guilty on seven counts of murder and one account of attempted murder. Following his sentencing, Erskine spent most of his sentence in Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire, which is one of the most well-known psychiatric hospitals in the country because of the high-profile patients that it's housed. Not a lot was really reported about Erskine during his time in Broadmoor, although he allegedly did help save the life of Peter Sutcliffe, who was also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, when he was being strangled by another inmate. In 2005, he was moved to a medium security facility as he was deemed to no longer be such a threat to the public as a result of his mental condition, and it was reported that he was allegedly recommended to be moved to a hospital in Stockwell of all places. In 2009, an appeal was launched and ultimately successful, which saw his murder charges be reduced to manslaughter charges on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Over the years, numerous doctors who have worked with Erskine during his stay in various hospitals had provided slightly different diagnoses of his mental condition, with one of them believing that he had been suffering from schizophrenia for quite some years and others stating that whatever condition he had would require lifelong treatment and that he should never be released to the public as a result. At some point, Kenneth Erskine had been transferred back to Broadmoor and then in 2016 he was deemed as less of a risk and so was moved to a medium security hospital unit in Berkshire. One thing worth noting is that it's not entirely known whether or not the attacks that Erskine was ultimately charged with had been the only attacks that he'd carried out, and due to his mental instability, it appeared unlikely that the authorities would ever know for sure. For a good few years now, there have been reports of Kenneth Erskine potentially being released from the secure hospital unit in the next few years, if he is deemed to be of a low risk to the public, but from what I can gather, he has not yet been released. And that is where I'm going to end today's video. So, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. As always, leave your thoughts down below, and I will see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.